Warning, this video contains a very mild spoiler for the end of Subnautica. If you're okay with that, then let's get to it. Everyone loves a good interstellar wormhole, and one of the coolest I've seen is during the cutscene at the very end of Subnautica. It's got this really interesting wobbly effect with loads of sparks and other doodads flying along towards you as you travel down the wormhole, and then everything bursts into a flash of white at the end. Hi, I'm Tim from Stonemate Games, and in this game dev experiment I'm going to try to recreate the Subnautica wormhole. This experiment is split into two videos. Part 1, which is this video, will concentrate on the wormhole itself, building it up using a shader graph shader. Part 2 will take the basic wormhole and then add particle systems and a timeline animation track to put together the cutscene. I'm using Unity 2021.3, which is the current long-term support version as of the time of this video, and I'm also using the Universal Render Pipeline. As always, the project files for this experiment are available on itch.io for you to download and play with, so check the description for the link where you can get hold of them. You've already seen the actual subnautica wormhole, but before we get started, let's see what our recreation is going to eventually look like, and then I'll take you step by step through the process of building it. It's highly likely that the developers of subnautica use different techniques to me, but I'm making my best guess as to how they might have done it, and I reckon my final version is pretty close. Okay, so how do we start with something like this? The wormhole is clearly some sort of twisty cone that is being distorted by a vertex shader to make it look all wobbly, so we're going to need plenty of vertices to play with. So let's hop over to Blender and whip up a quick cone model that we can use in Unity. I'm going to start by adding a cylinder. And I'm going to set the number of vertices to 64. And the depth to 20. I'm also going to leave the Generate UVs checkbox checked because we'll need that later. We're then going to move it up in the Z direction by pressing G, then Z, then typing in 10. Go into Edit Mode. Select Face Select. Grab the two end caps, and then delete them. Then open up the UV editing tab, and select all of the vertices using A. We'll need to grab all of the vertices that are halfway up in the UV plane, and move them down to the bottom. So grab them in the UV window, and press G to move, and then type Y, and minus 0.5. Head back to the modeling tab, and click Mesh, Shading, and Smooth Faces. We now need to convert the cylinder into a cone by selecting the top ring of edges. So select Edge, hold Alt, and click to select the whole ring. Then press S and 0 to bring that down to a point. To give us some vertices along the length of the cone, we need to add a load of loop cuts. So type Ctrl R, 100, and then Enter, and then Escape. Finally, select everything with A, then go to Mesh, Normals, and Flip. This is needed because we'll be viewing the cone from the inside. To make sure that the normals are pointing in the correct direction, we can go to the top where the viewport overlay is, and click the Display Normals option down here. If we look inside the cone, you can see that all the normals are pointing inwards, which is exactly what we want. OK, so now we have our cone, we just need to export the model to an FBX and drop it into Unity. In the import settings for the model, I've set the scale factor to be 5 to get the size about right, but it doesn't really matter, and you can change this to make it more appropriate for your needs, or you can change the size of the model in Blender before exporting it. If we drop our model into the scene, you can see that it defaults to a scale of 100, so I'm just going to reset that quickly. I've already positioned the camera so that it's facing directly up in the scene, so that it'll be looking along the length of the cone. And I've also got a little bit of bloom post-processing effect added to the scene as well. You can see that the cone currently looks nothing like a wormhole, so we'll swap out the material to one that uses the Shader Graph shader. And then I'll start adding in features while I walk you through the nodes that I used. First off, we've got a little bit of Fresnel added to the cone so that it appears brighter at the tip when we look along the length from the inside. Usually Fresnel is used to give the edges of a model a sort of glowy effect, but it works pretty well for this too. I'm going to change the Fresnel power to 6, but you can try different values to see what you prefer. Next, we'll add a bit of bend to the cone. I think 5 is about right. And we're also going to add a little bit of a twist using this twist frequency value here. I'm going to set the value to 1, which makes one full twist from the top to the bottom. OK, here's probably a good time to switch over to the shader graph to show you how these first few effects are achieved. I started with an unlit graph by right-clicking and going to Create, 
Shader Graph, URP, and Unlit Shader Graph. I'm going to show you the final graph rather than building it up node by node because it's pretty big as you can see, but I've broken it down into sections to make it easier to see what's going on. The Fresnel is pretty easy, it's just the Fresnel effect node multiplied by an HDR colour and the Fresnel power is also passed in as an input parameter too. This gets multiplied by a noise texture and some other details later on, but for now you can think of it just going straight into the base colour of the fragment shader. The bending and twisting is achieved by moving the vertices using the vertex shader and is handled by this collection of nodes here. This is why we needed a decent number of vertices in the cone model so that the distortion would be nice and smooth. This is also why we needed the UVs for the cone to be properly set up because we need these to know how far along the cone each vertex is so that we can move it by the right amount. The twisting is done by using a sine and a cosine node to push the cone sideways in a spiral pattern while another sine node is used to make the bend larger in the middle and zero at either end. We then take the results of these nodes and displace the position of the vertices along the x and the y directions, where z is the direction along the length of the cone, so we're only moving the vertices sideways here. We'll cover this noise part next, but let me show what it looks like in the model first so that we've got some context. Okay, so back in the scene view, let's add some noise to the wormhole. I've got a Perlin noise texture here that I generated using an online tool, and you can find the link to that in the description. I'm using a texture here instead of the built-in noise nodes because I need the noise to wrap around the cone without leaving a seam, so a tileable texture works better in this situation. If I increase the noise magnitude, you can see that the cone becomes crinkly. I'm going to set it to about 5 for now. I'm also going to increase this noise colour magnitude to help highlight the crinkles a little bit using the same noise texture. I'm going to set that to about 0.3. The noise tiling parameters allow you to increase or decrease the density of the crinkles, but always make sure you use an integer value for the X dimension, otherwise you'll see that seam I mentioned earlier. Using an integer X tiling value, make sure that the noise texture tiles properly, leaving no seam. Right, time to go back to the shader graph and let's see how these were implemented. The noise texture gets sampled here and the tiling is done using this tiling and offset node. The offset will come into play later once we start animating the wormhole, but I'll show you that in a bit. I use the UVs again here so that the size of the crinkles is largest at the base of the cone and decreases up to zero at the tip. I then use this noise to add some extra radial displacement to the vertices in this block that I showed you earlier. In addition to that, the noise texture is serving double duties because I'm using it to add that extra splash of colour to the wormhole by combining it with the Fresnel effect here. Back to the scene view once again. Now let's add some movement to the wormhole. I've got a couple of different ways to control time in this shader, manual or automatic. I'm going to use manual for now, but you can uncheck this box here to let the shader animate itself if you prefer. At the moment, nothing happens if you change the manual time. But if we increase the twist speed, and then vary the manual time up and down, you can see that the cone starts twisting around. If instead I set the twist speed to zero and increase the noise scroll speed, it now looks like we're flying through the wormhole while the crinkles rush past us. Combining the two gives this great effect where it looks like the wormhole is writhing around as you fly through it. Of course, the camera isn't really going anywhere, it's all just a neat illusion. I'm gonna set the twist speed to two and the noise scroll speed to 0.6 for now. In the shader graph, you can see where I set up the time controls over here. I use a Boolean keyword parameter so that we can switch between manual or automatic time, and then that time value gets passed through to all the various animated elements. The twist rotation comes in up here, while the noise scrolling comes in over here. We're done with the basic wormhole, but let's add a bit more interest with some extra texture detail. I've got two sections here where we can add layers of detail. They're pretty similar, but with one small difference. Both use a separate texture to add details, which you can then set to scroll along the length of the cone in the same way as the noise texture from before. You can tint the textures using an HDR color and set the tiling as before. The only difference between these two layers is the type of noise that I'm using to distort the textures as they scroll down the cone. The first uses Voronoi noise to give the distortion a sort of jagged effect while the second uses Perlin noise, which is called gradient noise in Shader Graph. Perlin noise gives a more wobbly type of distortion, so you can pick which one you want combined with whatever texture you prefer. 
I've used a sort of streaky texture for the first, which I've tinted bright red. The second is a set of coloured speckles, which I've left untinted but have boosted to be extra intense so that we get a bit of glow around them from the bloom post-processing effect. I've set up a boolean keyword for each so that you can enable them or disable them as you please. Setting the scroll speed and then changing the time value shows how those textures then scroll down the cone. The jiggle speed gives you an additional way to make these details move around, independent of the scroll speed. So you can play around with these two settings to see what you prefer. Or of course you can combine them together. In the shader graph these two sections at the bottom handle those detail layers. The time value comes in at the left and controls the offset in the same way as before. We then apply two layers of noise that scroll in opposite directions based on the jiggle speed and then use this to slightly distort the UVs of the texture itself. We then sample the texture using whatever tiling we want and scroll it using the offset before tinting it with an HDR colour. I do an extra multiply by the alpha channel here in case you have a transparent background in your textures but if you're using a black background like I am then this step isn't necessary. I also use the colour tint alpha channel to fade your details texture in and out if you like. Finally this details layer is added to the base wormhole colour over here. The second details layer is identical to the first except for the use of the gradient noise nodes here instead of the Voronoi nodes. You could of course replace these built in noise nodes with noise textures instead to give you more options but you get the idea. And that's it. Let me set up a few parameters real quick and then I'll show you the final result when using the automatic time. That's quite enough for one video, so in part two we'll take this basic wormhole effect and add some extra particle systems and a timeline animation to turn it from this into this. Thanks for watching, and I hope to see you in part two. Bye for now.